And we're continuing with the 24th chapter of A Little History of the World by E.H. Gombrich. Frederick II has just declared himself the king of Jerusalem, much to the Pope's dismay, and we continue. Then he set sail for home, taking with him presents given to him by the Sultan, hunting leopards and camels, rare stones, and many other curiosities. He, he had made a co- and he made a collection of these in Sicily, and engaged great artists to work for him, and took pleasure in beautiful things whenever he was tired of ruling. But he certainly did rule. He disliked the custom of granting land as fiefs. Instead, he appointed officials, rather than give them land, he paid them a monthly salary. For this, being Italy, they already used money, and he ruled justly, but also without great, but also with great severity. Frederick was so different from everyone else around him that nobody understood what he was trying to achieve. Least of all, Pope Gregory, who called him the Antichrist, while others called him Stupor Mundi, which means the wonder of the world. In far-off Germany, few people paid any attention to their strange emperor with his odd ideas, and because people didn't understand him, he had a hard life. Even his own son turned against him and stirred up trouble among the Germans, and his best loved loved advisor went over to the Pope, leaving Frederick entirely alone. Of all the ingenious and practical schemes he had hoped to show the world, very few saw the light of day. Unable to carry them out, he became increasingly bitter and ill-tempered, and so he died in the year 1250. His son Manfred died in a struggle for power when he was still a young man, and his grandson, Corand... Conradin was taken prisoner by his enemies and beheaded in Naples at the age of 24. Such was the sad end of that great ruling family of knights, the Hohenstaufens. But while Frederick was still reigning in Sicily and quarreling with the Pope, a dreadful misfortune overtook the world, which neither could prevent. Hordes of mounted warriors arrived from Asia. It was the time of the Mongols, the most fearsome of them, the most fearsome of them all, even Shi Huang Ti's great wall could not restrain them. Under their leader, Genghis Khan, they first conquered China, looting and sacking with appalling savagery. Then came Persia's turn, after which they took the path of the Huns, the Avars, and the Magyars toward Europe. So in terror and destruction, they first raged through Hungary and on through Poland. Finally, in 1241, they reached the German frontier town of Breslau which they seized and burned to the ground. Everywhere they went, there was slaughter. No one was spared. Their empire was already the greatest the world has ever had ever known. Just imagine, from Peking to Breslau. Moreover, in the course of their invasion, the troops had changed from savage hordes to well-trained warriors with very cunning leaders. Christendom could do nothing to stop them. A great army of knights fell before them. And then, when the danger was at its height, their emperor died somewhere in Serbia or somewhere in Siberia, and the Mongols turned back, leaving nothing but wasteland behind. In Germany, the death of the last Hohenstaufen led to greater confusion than ever. No one could agree on a new king, so none was chosen, and because there was neither a king nor an emperor nor anyone else in control, everything went to the dogs. The strong simply robbed the weak of everything they had. People called it the right of might, or first, or fist law, of course, might, n- might never is never a right, nor is it right. It's simply wrong. People knew this well enough and despaired and wished they could return to the old days. Now you can wish and you can dream, but if you keep on wishing and dreaming, you sometimes end up believing that what you want has come true. And so people begin to persuade themselves that the Emperor Frederick wasn't really dead, but under a spell in an enchanted mountain where he was sitting and waiting. And this, in its turn, had a remarkable effect. I don't know whether you have ever found yourself dreaming of someone who appears first as one person and then as someone else, and then, somehow, as both at the same time, because this is what happened. People dreamed that a great, wise, and just ruler, this was Frederick II of Sicily, was sitting deep down under the Kaifhauer Mountains and would one day return and make his purpose known, And yet, at the same time, they also dreamed that he had a great beard. This was now Frederick's grandfather, Frederick Frederick I, Barbarossa, and that he was all-powerful and would vanquish all his enemies and create a kingdom as wonderful and magnificent 
as it had been in the time of the great feast of Mainz. The worse things got, the more people expected a miracle. They pictured the king asleep inside the mountain, where he had slept so long that his fiery red beard had grown right through the stone table on which he leant. Once in every hundred years he would wake and ask his page if the ravens were still circling the mountain. Not until his page replied, No, sir, I can't see them, would he rise and split the table with his sword and shatter the mountain in which the spell had imprisoned him and ride out in the shining armor with all his men. You can imagine what people would make of that today. But in the end, no miraculous apparition came to set the world to rights. Just an energetic, able, and far-sighted knight whose castle, the Habsburg, or Hawk's Castle, was in Switzerland. His name was Rudolf. The princes had elected him King of the Germans in 1273, hoping that a knight so poor and obscure as he would be biddable and weak, but they hadn't reckoned on his intelligence and shrewdness. He may have started out with little land and therefore little power, but he knew a very simple way to obtain more, and with it more power. He went to war, with the rebellious King Ottokar of Bohemia, defeated him and confiscated part of his kingdom. As king, he was entitled to do this. Then in 1282, he bestowed the, he bestowed the same lands, which happened to be Austria, on his own sons. This formed the basis of the family's power. The Habsburgs were able to increase this power with a succession of new fiefs and by marriage and inheritance until they had become one of the most esteemed and influential noble families in Europe. It must be said that they ruled more over their vast family fief, by which I mean Austria, than they did over the German Empire, despite their title of German king and emperor. Those lands were ruled by other lords, dukes and bishops and counts, all of whom lived like princes, enjoying almost unlimited power over their domains. Nevertheless, with the last of the, Hof of the, Ho of the Hohenstaufens, the real age of chivalry had ended. And that is the end of chapter 24. This video is now part of a playlist with all of the other chapters in the book. There is also now a playlist for The Dark is Rising, uh, for Parsifal, and The Sword in the Stone. Check them out.